and welcome to the spooktacular atheist experience. Hello, everybody. Halloween coming up, and we've got our we've got our Whoa. pirate hat. So, our look out! I should have worn my eye patch. It's okay. We're gonna have the pirate hat all through the show in case uh, Anthony or I decide we're gonna use it. Uh, and then we also have our Halloween candy, and I've got my bottle of blood, and we're ready to roll. So let's see. We're broadcasting live on Sunday, October 29th, just a couple days before the big Halloween pop holiday 2017. I'm your host, Tracy Harris, and with me this week is a special guest, street epistemologist, Anthony Magnabosco. Hello, Hello. How are you? Great. We're glad to have you back. I'm, it's not your yeah. first rodeo, cowboy. Second time I was here yeah. back in June with Matt. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see. You can. There is a link to his YouTube channel that I've posted at the blog for the open show thread. So if you are not familiar with Anthony and you would like to become familiar, you can go check out his YouTube channel and see what he and street epistemology are all about. Uh, let's see, The Atheist Experience, we're sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, which is a Texas nonprofit educational organization that is dedicated to the separation of church and state and promoting positive atheist culture. You can watch us live every Sunday on YouTube or Ustream and comment on current shows at the current show thread supplied for each episode at the blog at freethoughtblogs.com forward slash AXP. You can also add comments on YouTube while the live show is running. Additionally, you can write to the show at tv at atheist-community.org, or you can join the Atheist Experience official discussion group on Facebook. After the show, the cast and crew go out to dinner at the Star of India restaurant at 2900 West Anderson Lane. We arrive a little after 6 p.m., and the dinner is a social event that is open to atheists and atheist-friendly people. One additional announcement that I have today is that there is something going on called the You Host Challenge that we're putting on. Um, I just learned about it right before the show. My takeaway from the quick conversation with our producer was that uh, the moderators will pick a question or a topic that was made on the show and ask fans, how would you respond? And when somebody answers and gets the most likes, they would win, and there's also going to be a moderator's choice for winners, and you can get uh, added to the show credits if you win, is what I've been told. Now, in light of the fact that there was not time to brief me thoroughly on this, I went ahead and added a link to the You Host Challenge at the, at the blog post for this open show thread. So if you are interested in that, or if it sounds interesting, or if you would like to get actually accurate information about what exactly it is, I recommend that you go to the blog and check that link and just see if it's something you'd be interested in. And I think that's everything I have. So welcome. Thank you very much. Yes. Very, very excited to be here. I'm excited. I gave a talk on street epistemology back when I was here in June, but I don't think you were able to make it, if I'm not mistaken. Probably but, not. But you showed up to the dinner good, after good. I was on the show, and we, we were able to talk a little bit about street epistemology. Yes. Which, for people that don't know what that is, it's, a, it's an approach for talking to people about their sensitive and deeply held beliefs in a way that doesn't close them down and hopefully helps you both better understand how they form the belief. It tends to work best in one-on-one -on -one environments. I'm not exactly sure how it will translate to this, to this type of venue where I'm, I'm not able to see the person's face, for example. Right, right. But I've been doing it for nearly five years now, and I'm so excited to be able to talk to, to people about this subject because I do think that this is probably one of the best ways to help a person reflect on their belief and help them think about it and, and possibly even revise their position on something that they may not have a good reason for holding the belief. The few times I've seen clips with people doing this, most of the people being interviewed are smiling and laughing. I, it's very mm. rare to see somebody getting upset or angry. I mean, I don't have you, yeah. do you run into that at all? It does happen occasionally, and it okay. used to happen more when I was going out for the first time and talking to people and I, I was a novice. I wasn't very good at it. Okay. But, but as I became more proficient at it, the amount of people that are angry at the end is very, very low. Okay. And I, I think about two weeks ago you showed a couple of examples where there was another person doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. his, his channel is Cordial Curiosity. And he has example after example of people doing it. And there are other people uploading content. And generally just having these conversations, not initiating them on the street with a camera, but just having them over social media 
they're just happening you know, organically. And yes, people really enjoy it. And, and I brought a couple of clips to show. Good, good. Where hopefully we can convey how a typical conversation usually goes. My understanding is that the way. studio has the clips queued up. So whenever yeah. you want to cue them, you just go ahead. I'm going to let you continue okay. with your intro and you just show the clips whenever you feel comfortable. I wanted to just talk about one thing. Um, sure. So we've been plugging away at this for about five years. And two weeks ago, I was in Manchester, England, giving a workshop on street epistemology to this. There was a skeptics conference going on oh, there. Oh, fun. It was great. There were about 600 people there, and about 150 decided to attend the workshop. We had to turn people away. So many people wanted to attend the workshop and learn this method. And people were, were attending this 50-minute workshop, learning the method, using it with people at the conference, and then reporting back their results. And it was just incredible how... It's fairly easy to pick up. It does take time to practice and learn. Sure. But it's 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 an incredible thing. And like I said before, I'm just excited to be able to to share it with other people. Yeah, definitely. Should we get to a clip? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let me set up this one clip. This was recorded about oh, probably about two years ago. I was standing on a trail in San Antonio, just flagging people down to see if they would chat with me with my camera. And this is a conversation with a woman who believes in God, souls, reincarnation. She's 100% sure that it's true. Typically, when I start to talk with somebody, I like to get a sense of where they are in terms of their certainty that it's true. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do that, but it's helpful to get a sense of, of how sure a person is. When this, when this clip starts playing, this is near the end of the conversation where we're kind of wrapping things up. And the main reason why she thinks that all of this stuff is true is because she thinks the God helped get her through a difficult time. Okay. Okay, so let's play clip number one, please. Is it possible that the souls and reincarnation and even the God in the slightest possibility could not be true? I mean, anything could be true. Some people believe that, but I don't believe that. I mean, it could be wrong. That's what I'm saying. You don't know. But I feel very strongly in my heart of hearts that what I believe is true. You know, having science degrees and everything else, it's, it's you know, there's, there's always a chance that you're wrong. You know? Is there a chance that you're mistaken on the God belief? I don't think so. Is it possible? I don't think so. I think there's something beyond. I truly, truly feel that way. Thank you so very much. <laughs> You're welcome. That was really enjoyable. I guess it's not 99 or 100 percent, but you know, I guess there's a, always a short, you know, 0. 0.0005 chance. But it's interesting. Are you saying right now here at the end of the talk that 100 percent confidence is not the most representative spot on the confidence of your belief? That's a good question. Because now I'm thinking back to where you said, you know, you believe 100% and then you, at the end of the conversation you don't believe. I guess, you know, I think you're right. I guess, I guess there's always a small chance that, you know, there's nothing. But I don't want to believe that. Does why, that make any sense? May I ask why you don't want to believe it? Because it's just, it's a sad thought for me. It's very, it just makes me sad. It makes me sad for me, it makes me sad for my children. That there's nothing that I want to believe that my soul, my energy, what animates me, what makes me who I am is going to go on in some way. You know, I, I truly believe like the whole thing that energy is not created or is not, you know, created or I can't remember exactly what the word is. But it's neither, it just neither created on. nor destroyed yeah, or exactly. something. Yeah, exactly. But you go on. Somehow that life force goes on. I want to believe that for me. I want to believe that for my children. Do the things we want to believe always mean that the belief is true? No. No, like I said, there's maybe a small chance that that's, that that's not the case. But, but I think me not wanting to believe that I just dismissed that. What do you mean? I'm sorry. Dismiss the possibility of that, small possibility of that. You dismiss the small possibility that it might not be true? Yeah, I don't think about it. Okay. 
All right. So that clip was about three minutes. And the thing that I love most about these conversations, generally when they happen semi-organically, I, I, I initiate it. But the best talks that I have are when people are willing to honestly examine their belief like this woman was. Uh, she was very, this conversation was very calm. It was respectful. When she was stumbling over her words on the whole energy is neither created right, right. nor destroyed, I was working with her to kind of figure that out rather than like laugh at her and, and you know, how could you believe it if you can't even verbalize it, that type of thing. And I, I was trying to really understand what she was saying and, and helping her feel comfortable where she could express her thoughts to me. I, I've never met her before. And it's amazing what people will disclose to you after you've just met them a few minutes you know, into, into a conversation. Uh, and then the revelation there is that she wants this, this belief to be true. It's, it's a sad thought to think otherwise. And like in the examples, like this example here or the examples that you were showing a couple weeks ago with, with Cordial Curiosity, um, these conversations are not meant to change people instantly. Usually people need some time to think about it. It's largely about placing a pebble, giving somebody something to think about so that eventually they will address it. Some people will ignore it and never face it and they're content with that. But a lot of people do wanna believe true things. And at their own pace, uh, if you can plant a seed, if you can plant a pebble, then they will likely go out on their own and try to figure this, or reach out to you later and say, can we meet again? Because I want to continue the conversation and that type of thing. Do you have any thoughts? My thoughts, I think, would be like mostly pedantry. I mean, um, I, I was struck by her explanation of how it's always possible you can be wrong and then when she's asked is it possible that you're wrong it was like no right well that's what <laughs> like, wow, that's, that's okay. why i push that i don't usually push that much but when somebody says that anything is possible then it would make sense that your belief is possible she was true. specifically saying that no matter how much how assured you feel or no matter how much information you have and no matter what supports you have you could still there's still that possibility you could be wrong and then she when, when asked, could you be wrong? Is it possible you're wrong? No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I don't think so. Um, so that was kind of an interesting thing to me. I agree with you that I, you know, I, I definitely get the, the vibe from her that she's being honest or attempting to be honest, but that was kind of a weird little disconnect, I think, in her own head. Yeah. Uh, and there's, um, additionally, there was a comment, I'm trying to think, that you had made about... Um, Shoot, I'm losing my train of thought here. But did I make it before the show? No, you made it during when you were talking about the clip. Uh, there was something about people not being to verbalize, being able to verbalize what they believe. Mm. And I, I definitely think when you're trying to, like, she's trying to recall a fact in that particular instance. So she's trying to remember a quote, you know, like a phrase that she's heard. And so I don't, I never fault somebody for not being able to accurately remember a piece of information. Yeah. But when uh, I do think that it's important for us to be able to verbalize beliefs in ways that are coherent in order for us to to allow other people to allow us the the idea that our beliefs make sense. So in other words, if I'm if I'm not able to express it coherently, there's no from a from trying to explain my belief to somebody, if I can't say it in a way that makes sense, I, I used an mm. example, um, I don't know if it was on the show or if it was in a talk or both, but there was a time when I was saying things like, oh, I felt like my beliefs were not my beliefs. And that's a completely incoherent mm. statement. Mm -hmm. So the onus would be on me to then delve into that experience and try to find a way to express it that's not incoherent. Yeah. I know I'm experiencing something. I know the way I'm expressing it is, it, is impossible. Mm -hmm. And so if I really want to, I, I can't even say that I understand it if I can't express it in a coherent way. So for me to be able to say that my belief is coherent even to myself, you know, because when I'm putting it out there and I'm expressing it, I have to acknowledge that what I've just said is logically impossible. It's funny that you're saying this because I have a second clip that I was mm -hmm. going to skip because it's only 30 seconds long. So I'm going to maybe put the guys sure. on the spot. If, if you if, think it's well, relevant. I think it, I think it might be relevant can because it. can you guys do that or you want to go just to the second? 
Okay, they, de oh. they deleted it. Okay. Um, Can you describe it? I'll or? describe it. So basically, uh, it's 30 seconds, so it was almost not worth showing, but since we're talking about it, we're reaching a point in the conversation where I ask her if I can summarize what I think she's just told me. Mm -hmm. And I say something like, it sounds like what you're saying is, yeah, I'm not 100% sure that it's true, but it's more comfortable for me to say that it's 100% true. And she said, yes, exactly, that's exactly. So that's why it's so important to listen very clearly and repeat back what people are saying, because I want to understand, but I also want them to hear their words coming back. And, and for her to hear what she's verbalized, maybe, maybe she misspoke. And this gives her an opportunity to, to correct it so that I can better understand her. Or she hears the words that she said and she realizes how incongruent they are. So um, I wanted to show that clip, but like mm -hmm. I said, it was just so short. Um, I do have one more clip. Sure. And uh, this one is one minute long. Uh, the talk is over and she pretty much just sort of volunteers how much she enjoyed the talk. So I wanted to include it. And her response is typical of, of a conversation that I might have with somebody using SE where they're just excited about it. And she talks about how she appreciates the open conversation. She wishes that there was more of it. Okay. Okay, so the second clip, please. <laughs> Thank you so very much. You're welcome. I have a card here. That's interesting. And that, that was way more than five. Okay. Um, if you want to keep talking, I would love to keep examining this belief with you. That's very interesting. What is, what is, this, what is this for? I call it a hobby, but there are thousands of people that are starting to have conversations with people about all sorts of stuff. Politics, yeah. God, karma. I think it's great. Did you enjoy it? I did. Okay. I really did. Well, that's good. What did you like about it? I like that... I think it's just nice to be able to... You know, it's always nice to be listened to. And you're a great listener. Hmm. So, you know? I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's you. always just nice to be able to... Sometimes people are so quick to dismiss your ideas. And... Um, you know, because of their own ideas. And it's very... It's a breath of fresh air to just be able to say what you believe without... I don't feel like you had any condem condemnation or any judgment about... I mean, that's, that's wonderful. Okay. I, I wish people would have more open conversations about things. Politics. Yeah. Yeah. Religion. Yeah. All the big all the biggies. <laughs> all the biggies, all the biggies. All right, so that's what I really like about it is that she recognizes that this this is a method that that can be used for all sorts of beliefs, her sensitive God belief, maybe politics, the things that we no, don't normally like to talk about, the things that become confrontational, like sure. Thanksgiving is coming up. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about Halloween, <laughs> but Thanksgiving is coming up. And and usually we avoid these conversations, but this method of street epistemology, I think, is a great way to approach these sensitive topics without destroying your Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and and, and uh, so, yeah, I'm very excited about it. I, I think it's a potential solution, uh, which is which it, get, it gets me so excited about, is that um, we don't have to skip having these talks. We can, we can really have these talks and usually end on a good note where okay. both people enjoy the conversation. Well, good. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, you know, keeping it positive, there's certainly no downside. To this method? To keeping it positive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, well, there's probably some downsides, but uh -oh. yeah. Um, that being said, not every conversation goes well. Okay. There are some people that, that are upset that I've even asked that uh, if we can explore a deeply held belief because that typically what I find is that when people become irate about asking the questions, they tend to be the ones that are questioning it the most. And, and sometimes people generally, don't, they don't even usually want to talk about the politics. They'd rather talk about their God belief because they've been burned so many times when it comes to talking about political things that they, they don't choose that topic. They want to talk about their God belief instead. Well, I mean, I think probably, I, I guess there, there would be people that might not be comfortable just talking to a stranger. I don't know that they would get irate so much as, you know, basically just be like, yeah, no, thank you. My experience, though, is that people tend to be more open to talk to a stranger about something sensitive, especially if you can make them feel comfortable and, and just assure them, even though you have a camera. Okay. Like, hey, let's talk about this. I'm not going to be a jerk about it. I want to really listen to you. I can record our shoes and, and not your face if you want, but let's just really explore this belief. This is an opportunity to explore. And, and most people 
jump at the chance to talk about these things. It's really interesting. Okay. It may be cultural. This may just be a Texas thing. I don't okay. know. It might be different if I was doing this in Finland. Interesting. Yeah, that would be, well, you said you did it in England. I, well, I gave a workshop on it, but I wasn't oh, okay. able to get out and do it on the street. Okay. Yeah. All righty. But other people did it. It doesn't have to be it. on the street. <laughs> okay. Yes, other people can do it. All right. So, um, should we go ahead and take some calls? Yeah, sure. All right, I want to start with um, Rita online too, because she was very nice and helped us with our uh, phone testing. So, uh, hi, Rita. Hi. This hi. is Tracy and Anthony. <laughs> hi. Hello, hey. Rita. Thanks for calling in and thanks for helping us test. So what's on your mind today? Um. Well, I grew up in a half Jehovah's Witness home. Okay. Like, my mom was a Jehovah's Witness, became a Jehovah's Witness when I was little, and my dad was just a controlling and um, abusive asshole. So she was a Jehovah's Witness. They were our support network. She's really, they, are, they still are her support network. I grew up, moved out, discovered the world they've been hiding from me and got disfellowshipped. Okay. Um, Can you explain what that means for people that might not know? Hmm? Could you explain oh, what that means for people? Like excommunicated, she can't talk to me mm -hmm. unless there, it's official family business. Like if somebody dies or if she's dying, she can let me know. But other than that, she doesn't talk to me. Sorry. Um, she delayed the shunning right after I got this fellowship because I got in a bad car accident and she felt like she needed to, you know, be there for me. There were other times in the past where she kind of bucked against the system. Like, you know, she stayed with my father because their whole read of the, you know, their literal fundamentalist Christian they believe, you know, there is no divorce unless there's adultery. So she stayed with him and at, like when I was a junior in high school, he cut the brakes on the car thinking she was going to take it to work and I did. And that was the last try. And she said, no, it doesn't wait, wait. matter. Hold on a second. I'm out. Are you saying that, I'm sorry. what did you mean when you said they cut the brakes on the car? I think she's saying that her is my dad, her dad sabotaged the my car. My was taking the car to work, so he cut the brakes on it, thinking she was going to be in it and get in an accident. And I took the car to school that day because there was something wrong with my car. And that was the last straw she left him. Like, so she's, you know, shown some basketball in the past, I guess is my point. Okay. So what is what is your question today then, Rita? Um, I guess my question is, she's so deep in at this point, and like about eight years ago, the shunning has gotten worse. Like she really doesn't talk to me anymore. She moved a few months ago. I don't even know where she's at now. Okay. So I don't get very many chances to talk to her. When I do, should I... I even try and change her beliefs because, you know, if I create a vacuum, what fills it? Mm. And if I do, how can I do it in a non-confrontational way that she won't take as any tap well, this is your call, Anthony. <laughs> well, yeah, um, <laughs> I'm really glad that you called. Have you heard about street epistemology yet? I I had just caught started checking you guys out um, maybe a couple of weeks ago. I joined the Facebook group and excellent. Yeah, there's I've a Facebook group video. for people that want to learn street epistemology. You I search. just want to be clear. When you say you joined the Facebook group, are you talking about street epistemology or are you talking about this show? Yes, I cha I joined the street epistemology. Okay, I just wanted to be make sure we were all on the same yeah, page. Go that's ahead. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so. Yeah, well, I feel for your situation, for sure. And if I understand right, your mother is still in this belief and you want to help her. Yes. Okay. But at the same time, I, I feel 
like, I question, am I helping her? Because if I take away these beliefs she has, like, this is her support system. These are her friends. These are her only friends at this point. Yeah. And this is a big part of her identity, too, I would imagine. So it, right. you're asking very difficult questions. And there, I don't think that there's an easy right. answer. So you know, getting involved in like the street epistemology group is great, but perhaps even better might be there are XJW groups. I, I hope you're a part of one of those. And you know, I know that Recovering From Religion has, if I'm not mistaken, they have a support group forum specifically for XJWs. I hope that's the case. If not, Dr. Ray, I'm very sorry, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that they do. And I'm certain that there are XJW Facebook groups that are out there. So I think if you're not already aligning yourself with some of those communities to meet with people who have I already gone through what you're going through, stuff. I think would be good. I'm sorry. I, I said I've seen, I've read some forums and things, but okay. I've never joined any groups. You can, the, the, some of the best suggestions, I think, for how to proceed could probably come from the people who have already gone through what you're going through. Or I, I going have to, through yeah, I would agree with that. I, yeah. I definitely agree. I think if there are people who have, like he's saying, if, if they've addressed it in a way that it didn't work, they might be able to tell you, here's what I did that just blew up in my face, um, or here's what I did that went really well. Right. Because she's not supposed to talk to me because I'm disfellowshipped, but if I make it blatant and obvious that I'm challenging her beliefs, then I get labeled as an apostate, yeah. which is like, a step worse. So my <laughs> my advice in these situations, Rita, is to you don't have to always use SE. You can learn it and you can teach it. So one thing that I like to do in these delicate situations is try to teach the people in your life how to question beliefs. And it doesn't have to be about whether Jehovah is God. You can teach your mother how to use these these questioning techniques for any claim that she runs into. Some of the easier stuff, like one of the, one of my favorite examples is you always hear about how red cars get more speeding tickets than, than any, any other color car. Well, is that really true? Listen for when your mother makes some sort of claim or somebody else nearby makes a claim, and then you can start questioning that with the idea of teaching your mother how to use these tools so that she can question those things herself, and then ultimately, start questioning this big one, the big guy, I believe. And I wrote a blog post about this. Uh, so there's not, like, one question that... See, the, the problem is, if I do get a chance to talk to her, it will it will be somebody died and we're going to a funeral, or, you know, okay. it'll be an afternoon, and it won't... Oh, I, I, I follow you. You have limited yeah. interactions with your mom at this point. Right. Mm. What if you asked your mother if she'd be willing to talk to you about the things that keep you from being a JW, about your own personal concerns and doubts? She would tell me that she can't do that. She would, she would have an elder call on me from the congregation. I see. So she would, she'd outsource it. Okay. Right, because they don't want her questioning her beliefs. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, okay. Well, it's tough. You know, if they're if there's if they're building a wall between you two, then it really severely limits and, your ability to help. Well, the other thing is, I mean, can you live with the possibility that this conversation may never happen and that you may remain estranged from your mother? I think I kind of have to live with that at this. I mean, that might be the but case. I just I feel like I should do something before it's too late, you know? I mean, she's oh. getting up there. She's like 67 now. I mean, I, I can't really wait 20 years to do this, you know? Yeah, I think here's the, the thing that I often, I don't, I don't know how it's going to affect you, but a lot of people feel better when they consider that the onus to maintain a relationship when it comes to parents and children should be on the parents, not the children. Um, when you produce another person and you take responsibility for that and then you basically tell that other person now you're responsible for maintaining and initiating and keep, you know, keeping up this relationship, I see that as grossly unfair. I think that if a parent can't 
hold up their side of that relationship, the child should at the very least not feel guilty about the lack of a relationship. I mean, it's one thing if a child wants to pursue it, that's completely up to them. But I've seen too many people who struggle to maintain a relationship with a parent who is either um, continually uh, somehow mentally abusive to that person or that they simply do not show a lot of interest in that person or their life or their family or what's going on with them. And the, these people, like I say, it's one thing to maintain the relationship. It's another thing to feel bad about it. Like what you're expressing, this idea that, well, what if, you know, when it, you don't want to wait till it's too late. If it, if it doesn't happen before your mother should, you know, pass away, then the reality is that was on her. If I could just add one thing, too. That's true. If I could just add one thing, too, Rita. You might want to ask yourself, if your mother's best intentions are in mind here and if it would cause her tr stress to be engaging with her and trying to reach out to her and trying to change her or whatever if if that's if that causes more harm then maybe that's not the path that you want to go so i would just and i guess that was my question in the first place should i i mean yeah should i ruin her belief system without I don't know. I, I just feel Well, bad. I mean, her like, belief system is her, at odds with a relationship with you, which makes it tough because you've got these competing interests. Right. You would like to have a relationship with your mother. Um, and then at the same time, you don't want to do damage to her current beliefs, but they can't coexist. So you, you're looking for a way to eliminate the competing interest. And I understand that it's certainly one route a person can go, but then you have to ask yourself, how realistic is this and how much time and resource do I want to put into this without knowing that this could actually ultimately be successful? It's a big investment. It's, this is tough because these are barriers that your mom is, is erecting and she's erecting them because of the belief that she holds. Sure. And you know, she has a right to believe in whatever she wants. She's making this choice, and you're just along for the ride. And I, I can definitely empathize with how frustrating that must be, to just be, you know, watching her drive to the towards this cliff that you that you think is there. And you know, th this is her and life. Not even really knowing how fast she's going towards it. You know, I mean, like I have no idea what the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching nowadays. I have no clue what they're yeah I, I don't i don't think i could offer much more other than really check out the groups that are out there uh look for the jehovah's ex jehovah's yeah. witnesses groups i think that's the best advice we can give you rita okay well thank you for <laughs> i wish i wish we had a magic like, bullet i, I wish i wish we can offer you more I than that but yeah i think that's going to be your best you again bit. all right well thank you thank you okay that's tough it is tough bye, -bye. Bye-bye. All right. Um, and if anybody has advice for Rita at the blog, feel free to chime in. Uh, maybe we can help her out there. So let's see. Did you want to go for it or did you want to wait? Oh, we can take whatever call you want. <laughs> okay. We're going to go for call number four then. We'll, we'll talk to TJ. So uh, welcome, TJ. This is Tracy and Anthony today. Hi, TJ. What's up, people? How you doing? Good. Good. What's on your Thanks mind? Thanks for holding. Okay. Well, one for Rita. If she's still listening, this is my advice to her. One, uh, the Jehovah Witness was started by the occult, so they already have an occult background. So whatever your mom's believing is false. That's the first thing. One, God does exist, but my advice, if you can, try to get her out. She would probably agree with you on the first point, but maybe not so much the second yeah, she's point. She's probably already aware of the first point, to be Maybe honest. we can talk about why you think... Yeah, what, what's your call? Yeah. Oh, my call? Yeah. Oh, my call is to, like, just explain... You, you guys are wrong. God was proven three years ago. This shit is so easy now. He's not even far away. He's only a few miles. So you called to prank us. Is no, I didn't call to prank you. I'm he's, being dead serious. He's three miles away from us right now? I said a few miles away. Oh, a few is, miles. Is it? So God is in, is, in t is in, like, time and space? No, no, no. He's probably only, like, a thousand miles away. Estimated. What happened estimated. to a few miles? Hey, look, you, what, do you, what do you want? You want a universe that's, like, huge and gigantic and that's, like... Okay, TJ's a prank. reaching for the button. <laughs> yeah, that's... I, I don't... I can't take that call seriously. It's really unfortunate because... 
Yeah. I want to talk to people who believe in a God. Yeah, don't call to prank the show. We don't have time for this. This um, is your chance to have an honest talk about why you believe. Yeah. So please, if, if you're on the fence about examining this belief, yeah. call in. We have a Shows few lines open. an hour and a half, and we don't have time for this. And so let's see. We'll go with, we, we do want to get a theist on, so we do have one on the line that's holding. So we'll go with Mark. Hi, Mark. We're hoping you can <laughs> do, do a little more justice to your, to your team there. This is Tracy and Anthony. How are you doing today? Hi, Tracy. Hi, Anthony. I'm Mark. And Hi. I did call to talk about serious things. Okay, good. Um, um, and actually, it's interesting. I just wanted to take a side note because uh, I was interested in what Anthony was saying about street epistemology because uh, recently in my Christian walk, uh, I've taken a conference and I've become a, a street preacher and we sort of take the same kind of uh, track that he takes. We'll talk to people about their beliefs and find out why you believe what you do and then we'll share why we believe what we do and we'll have a little discussion right there on a street corner like uh, in Toronto, Dundas Square. Honestly, I, uh, I, in a way I kind of admire what you're doing because I think that's probably the best way to get through to people is to have a conversation with somebody. Now, when, when I go out and do this, I don't try to promote a worldview. Um, yes, I want to understand okay. what they believe, why they believe it, and how they're so sure. But then once we recognize that Carrie, for example, doesn't have a good reason to believe that there's a God, I don't then give her, uh, I don't know, the link to the Atheist Experience website or something well, like that. Well, just if I can chime in, because I've watched mm -hmm. some street epistemology videos and I don't do street epistemology, but one of the things I do notice is that they're very, the ones that I've seen have been very hesitant to share their personal views. Honestly, I like to hold back on yeah. telling people where I stand on it. In, in fact, in that conversation with Carrie, if I'm not mistaken, she asks, she wants to know where I stand. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little reluctant to because I don't want my... Uh, my own views to taint the conversation. Well, I've actually seen sidestepping, side not dishonest, but just a way to kind of say, let's steer away from my views and let's just talk about what you think. I and, usually and say I remember, something like, can we, can we, I'll be glad to answer that in the, when the timer goes off. Well, when I watched um, Reed, for example, someone hmm. asked him about something like that and his response was something like, I want to know, is, you know, I, I want to look for good ways to tell what's true. Sure. That's my sure. position is just finding ways to determine the truth. Yeah, so you know, valid you, ways. Yeah. Do you so when you engage with people are you truly interested in in the reliability of how they're coming to their beliefs or do you think that you have the answer for them and then do you use it as an opportunity to promote your view? Um well, honestly, um obviously because I'm going out in the venue, we're going out in a venue of street preaching, preaching the gospel. But we do have open di dialogues and discussions, and a lot of the conversations that have taken place with people I've met on the street have made me think about my beliefs and reassess things, and it's actually strengthened my faith because it's like, hey, I never thought about that before. I'll go away, and I'll think about it. I'll do some research, and it's like, yeah, actually, that does make sense. That's good. I mean, that, that's the whole benefit of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Like, Whether you're doing it from your point of view or I'm doing it from the street epistemology view, like... You know, I, I want to drive towards truth. I want to understand what people believe and, and how they're so right. sure and believe what they believe if they have a good reason for it. Uh, I'm, like, I'm not trying to push my view on anybody. I'm just, like, expressing, uh, exercising my freedom of speech sure. and, and expressing what I believe and then engaging in anybody that wants to engage with me. Yeah. And then okay. we'll have a dialogue, and I'll say, this is why I believe what you do. Why do you believe what you do? And so then, if, uh, cool. if Anthony were to ask you, what's your, what's your lead in, Anthony? Hmm. Well, my I guess my my lead in you, is... You see Mark on the street and you say... Yeah, I just kind of want to get a sense of why you actually... Well, what what do you mean by God specifically? Is it a specific religion? And why are, why are you so sure that it's true? Maybe what is your main reason? And then I like to shift into the how. That's kind of the most important thing is how are you determining that this God is real or that that was actually a miracle that happened? Uh, that's kind of what well, I, I sort of take the William Lane Craig approach, the, you know, the causal, the, the uh, watchmaker argument, the cosmological argument that, you know, nothing, uh, some, it's, it's not physically possible for something to come from nothing, that logically speaking, that there must be something to cause everything. Mm -hmm. And I know there's, there's scientific debates back and forth. Lawrence Krauss has made his book, A Universe from Nothing. So I'm not saying I know 100% for certain that God exists. I'm just saying that I have a higher confidence that there is a creator than that there isn't. Did you I put my money on the I'm sorry. On the side that there is a creator. That's that's what I'm saying. 
Okay. Did you become more confident in your belief in the God after you discovered those arguments, or were you, you know, were you just as confident as you were before you discovered those? Well, I grew up in an agnostic, non-religious home, and I spent years looking at this and researching it, and just looking around at everything. Like I know you've you guys heard all these arguments before. This is nothing new under the sun for you. Just, but just to quickly go over it, like you know, you look at things like cars and buildings and stuff, and it's like. Well, if someone was to tell me that that just, you know, stirred up out of a storm in the desert, I think the guy's crazy. So why should I believe that the universe and all life on Earth just stirred up out of a storm and here we are? That There must be an intelligence behind well, it. Well, wait, can I, just, when I, can I just interrupt and ask a quick question? And I don't want to derail it, but according to your belief that crazy storm in the desert is actually the building. If everything is designed, then everything right? would be... There's no such thing as a non-designed thing, so the wreckage from a desert storm is, to you, you know, evidence of design. No, okay, I, I know that. I, I, I understand the circular reasoning in that aspect, but it's, it's still, it's like, I, I don't know. Like I said, like I've li listened to the arguments back and forth. Like, um, I know you, you're aware of who John Lennox is, Tracy. You've had a caller on one of your past shows tell you about him. He had an interesting rebuttal to Lawrence Krauss. He said the fact that the universe is intelligible, intelligible is evidence that there must be an intelligence behind it because it's never been demonstrated that intelligence can come from non-intelligence. I'm still wait I'm still curious though about I mean up to you a pile of rubble is just like a skyscraper. Right? Yeah, that was that was simp that was simplifying the argument, but you know, to, to expand on it and make it more complex, like we can make mathematical models and predict the movements of planets from cosmic structures all the way down to subatomic structures, and we see a symmetry between quantum physics and astrophysics okay. on every scale. Okay. Here, you know, I have a story I'd like to tell. I didn't, I, I haven't, I thought about this this earlier. Someone asked me if I had anything to talk about, and I was like, oh, I have a little story, but I didn't tell it. And I, this is weirdly appropriate. I was at a party last night, and there were several magicians working this party. And one of them did a trick, and a person in the audience chose a card, right? You know, pick a card, any card. And they happened to choose the three of clubs. And so the magician went on and on doing all these tricks, and they kept showing up the three of clubs. So they would shuffle the deck and do all kinds of crazy things with the deck, and then pop out the three of clubs on top. And then they would do all these other things with the cards, and then they'd pop out the three of clubs. And it, it, was, it was very funny, right? Like they, the way they kept bringing up the three of clubs, even though they were doing all these things to manipulate the deck. Later that same evening, a magician who had not been there when that trick was done came in, and he pulled the magician who was doing the original trick, and he started doing a trick with him, and he was just like, okay, pick a card. And it happened to be the three of clubs. And I happened to be on the side where I could see it, and I just laughed, and I turned to the magician who had picked the three of clubs, and I said, that's irony. Nobody, n nobody on the other side of the room knew what we meant because they couldn't see the card, and the magician who wasn't there for the original trick didn't know what we meant. And he's like, okay, I don't know what that means, but let's keep going. So he kept going with his little trick. And then later at the end of it, when he said, here's your card, and everyone could see it, the whole room busted up laughing, and they were just like, oh my gosh, it's the three of clubs again. Now, one could say that it almost seems like those two magicians must have planned this because how could the three of clubs come up in the next trick with no, you know, it just seems like that wouldn't just randomly happen and yet it did. And because okay, I it, hear, do you understand what I'm saying? I hear what you're, yeah, I hear what you're saying and, and, I, and I see that and I've considered that. That's why I said I didn't just, like I said, I grew up in an agnostic home and I spent years going back and forth in my mind between this, like is. Because like I, I, like I get that, right? But then one could say that maybe for all you know, I'm, I'm not saying this is the case, but it is theoretically possible. Maybe that was a pre-planned thing that they pre-planned it before they went to the party. Now, I'm not saying that they actually did that. Right, but I would have no reason to believe that it was, I guess is my point. What I'm interested okay. in, Mark, if I can, is it sounds like this idea of things appearing designed, you're surfacing it as one of the reasons why you think that your God is real. And I'm wondering is if, um, 
all of these instances. That's just a scratching the surface. Got it. Reason I, why. I got it, and it was, but it was one example that you that you mentioned, which is why I'm kind of focusing on it. If okay. every instance of design, and things that you think are being designed, are designed, could be shown to your satisfaction that they were not designed, that they could form naturally. Okay, and you you were convinced by the evidence that was shown to you. Would that affect your confidence in the God existing in any way? Sure, I guess, but I don't even, I can't even fathom how you'd go about doing that, what method you would, could even come, come up with to, to do that. That's okay. like... You, but you, it sounds like you are open to hearing people explain how these things could happen. No, I've read people's theories. Like I, like I said, I'm well aware of Lawrence Krauss's book, Universal Nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm just not terribly convinced by their arguments. Like for sp specific to Lawrence Krauss, I've heard him say in uh, panel board discussions, interviews and debates that he doesn't want to live in a universe where God exists, that the thought of God's existence is depressing for him. Now, that to me tells me he has a prejudicial bias view. How do I know he's not skewing his information to perfectly slant to say that there's no such thing as God. Mm -hmm. How do I know he's being honest and objective? He's still a human being. Sure. Like he's sure. a well-accomplished scientist, but he's still a human being. Right. Yeah, we, we absolutely have our biases. And I think that's a good question. And I think that that should be something that would have to be addressed before, yeah, before I would accept information, uh, evidence too. Is there some inherent bias going on here? Is this person have an agenda, that type of thing? Uh, yeah, exactly. Like I'm not, See, like what I'm saying is, is right. Like, what what um, secular atheistic people, scientists like Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I can list them all off, right? Um, what they say about Christian scientists like Ken Ham and you know some of the other famous ones, Kent Hovind and whatever, like they're they're purposely skewing information to make the Bible true. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. How do I know they're not doing that to make the mm -hmm. anti-biblical, anti-God view be true? Right, right. No, I, I understand that, that that would be a concern, especially when you hear, well, how caustic we can be towards the other side. Like, I, I, I totally get that, that one might be less reluctant or less willing to accept a claim or evidence because of the concern of bias. Like, it's very hard to set aside one's bias when you're presenting evidence. But, right, and that's why, like, to answer your question, if if my burden of proof was satisfied and I was convinced yes. there's no funny business, no scamming going on here, then yeah, I would be willing to consider the possibility of everything coming from randomness and chaos, just natural stuff. But good, good, good. as it stands right now, I, I don't see anything that convinces me that that's possible. Everything I see... See, and I see the opposite. Like, I, what I see is a natural universe that does everything the natural universe does and no evidence that there is a an agent a more complex agent that has produced it like i don't see evidence of the agent i bet i see plenty of evidence for the natural universe so yeah that's and, and i get that and i get that tracy like and, and i realize that everybody has their right to see the universe from their own perspective view and that's why we naturally attract to like-minded people who will see things similar to but them. i didn't i guess my story is that i was a believer and i got myself out of the church by studying the history of the church, the history of the Bible, and realized that this was all man-made. And then when I went on for another 10 years investigating what is God, I couldn't really locate God. I couldn't figure out what God was. I couldn't label it or, or identify it, or there was nothing that I could find that I could actually say this is God. Like, there, wow. what is so, there? I mean, what is like, God? That's in, like it, that's interesting. You what you said that was the actually the opposite exact. Opposite. No, I know because I heard your description earlier. But I guess what I'm wondering then is what it, it, do you agree that things that do not exist cannot be the cause of other things? Things that do not exist. Can, yes, I agree with that. Yeah, and I mean I mean that in a broad context. Like at some point, it must have existed in order to cause something. It may not exist now. You know what I mean? Some things create things and then they stop existing. Um, and I get that, but in, but in essence, a thing has to exist or have existed in order to be a cause. And so when we say that God is the cause of the universe, our next step has to be to demonstrate that cause God exists, not just to give a hypothesis for why we think that it's necessary, but we, all, we actually have to take that next step of validating okay, I, that there I is an existent God. I can answer that, though. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, so I'm assu- I'm assuming you, you you sound like a very smart, clever um, woman. I'm um, not. <laughs> well, but thank you. I'm assuming you you know what prejudicial bias views are in psychology. Sure, I, I understand prejudice. I understand it's, bias. It's, it's like con- we, it's all so we all have right. biases. We all have biases. Yeah. Okay, so um, if like for example, the like for instance, the um, emergence and explosion of the early Christian church. Now, some people like yourself will look at that and say, "Well, that could have happened within naturalistic bounds, and there doesn't necessarily mean that this is a supernatural divine intervention that caused this." And sure, that is a relative possibility. But it doesn't dismiss the possibility that there's a supernatural agent behind. But why would I invoke a supernatural agent when I know that an emperor promoted the religion? I mean, if you make it the state religion, not it's going to take not off. Till the four, not till the end of the third century A.D. Yeah, and they Look were at, subversive up until later, until much later. I mean, the, the gospels themselves weren't written for you know decades, maybe even a century after. I mean. This is the, the idea that the church took off is there's a movement gaining traction is hardly evidence of the supernatural. Okay, but my point is the fact that the conditions that it came up in, and I'm applying personal life experience here and the naturalistic aspect of my personal life experience because I got saved in jail. So I have, I know personally what it's like to feel hunted and chased like the whole world's out to get you. And I can tell you with personal life experience if I knew the Roman Empire was out to get me, I'm not going out in public squares praising Jesus Christ, knowing they're kicking in doors looking for me. Right, but you understand that there are zealots who do, and there are movements. I mean, look at, for example, ISIS. That's a horrible movement, and you would almost ask yourself, how in the world would anyone join it? And yet they are collecting <laughs> followers, right? Even though the whole world is hunting them. It happens, and they oh, are, they are okay. famous, they are growing. They are dangerous and awful, and yet they, they continue to gain traction even though they are the antithesis of everything good. And okay, but we've only observed that for, for a decade or two. We're talking like three centuries that the Roman Empire did everything they could within their means to try to crush and obliterate white... Well, you're Roman assuming that, for the, that right at the beginning they, they even cared about this. Mainly Rome what was... What about Nero? Yes, they didn't care. Yeah, please. Okay, um, we we have like eight other or six other callers yeah, on the line, enough. but okay. but, I, but one just one one question here. You don't have to answer it now. You can answer it later if you want. But it seems like you have a very high standard for people who could show that your belief is not true. Do you do you hold yourself to the same standard? Are you just as careful about bias and prejudices and all these other things? as you are yeah, for your absolutely. own belief. You are, okay. Absolutely, because I have to be, because that's, like I said, I came to know, I came to this belief while I was in prison, and this is applying all of the critical thinking skills I learned in my therapy to overcome uh, drinking drugs and crime, and my concern was, am I being biased because I grew up in an agnostic home? Am I being open-minded and objective to the possibility that this could be true? And if this has any bound to help me, like I've read, so many people worldwide, millions upon millions of testimonies of people worldwide who have overcome. Hey, I still me. don't understand. I mean, I, first of all, I still don't feel like I've gotten an answer to the original question of how is a pile of rubble, rubble the same as a skyscraper. But I also don't know what, where is the demonstration of the cause God? Does God exist now or did it exist before and it no longer exists? Well, like I'm saying, all these different things. Does it exist? Wait, does it exist right now? Uh, yes. Okay, can you please tell me where, like, in what way does it exist? In what way can we demonstrate it? Because what good is existence that cannot be demonstrated? It's no different than not existing. Um, other than the evidence of transform, redeem lives, the people who've overcome. No, you're talking about, you're saying that the cause God is causing these transformed lives. I'm not asking you to show me what you think the hypothesis of God is, the, is causing these things. I'm saying, where is the God? Because it has to, things that do not exist cannot cause other things. Does this God exist? And if so, in what form and where and where is the direct demonstration of the God? Okay, but just because they can't demonstrate that God doesn't exist does not mean that God doesn't exist. But it does Absolutely. mean that God can't be, de- can't be de- told from something that doesn't exist. A thing that you cannot demonstrate exists is no different than a thing that you cannot 
that, that doesn't exist? How do we tell things that don't exist from things we can't tell whether they exist or not? Um, okay, well, when I pray to uh, a pink unicorn, nothing happens. When I pray what do you mean? Unicorn. There's actually, if you pray, I, if I pray to a pink unicorn that I find a parking space, I might find a parking space. Ugh. Right? Yeah, but um, does it, will it transform your life and give you the power to overcome drinking drugs and crime? If you could, you? the thing is, there you can transform your own life. People do it all the time. And so this is not evidence for a God. This is evidence that lives are transformed. You're claiming that the cause is God, and I'm saying that the cause of you, right, you doing it yourself, you exist and may be a cause of this thing. If the God is going to be a cause of it, you have to show the God exists as much as you can show you exist. Where does this, in what way does this God exist? Okay, fine. Let me, let me, then let me close with this because you got other callers. How would you propose I do that? Like, because I know what you're saying it exists. I'm asking you, you say you believe it exists, that you're aware of it. And so you're saying it can be a cause. Therefore, this thing must be manifesting in some way. Can you please just demonstrate the manifestation that you seem to be aware of that I'm not? I'm not sure how to do that. Just yeah, do I don't think I'm sure how to do that either. And that's what makes me think that we can't use it as a cause. We cannot plug in God as a cause until we can demonstrate there actually is a God. Because things that do not exist cannot be the cause of other things. That means that if we're going to include it among the possible causes, it has to at least be known to exist. And we don't know that about your God. So just to wrap this up, I think, Mark, in closing, I think... You're, you're asking good questions. Like you just asked a great question. How could, I, how could I figure this out? How could I test it? How could I show that this is true? Those are the types of questions that I would encourage you to keep asking. And, and feel free to reach out to us or, or to me directly if you want to keep talking about this. But um, I, I, think, I think you're on the right track, honestly. I mean, I, I think, there, of course, there are some things that are flawed there, but... But um, I really appreciate the call. I mean, to be honest, I'm really glad that you called, and I thought that it, I think it's a good call, and I think that a lot of the people that are watching are going to appreciate your call. So even though I can be a little rah rah rah, I know that um, I want you to know that I that I'm glad that you called and I liked the call. Okay, I didn't I actually didn't get to talk about the topic I wanted to. <laughs> okay, it was sleep paralysis is yeah. what they they said. Okay, you were on. Yeah. But oh, was that? <laughs> you can you know what. Post it at the blog if you want to. Um, there's a lot of people that had some interest in that, and so you might get a little conversation going there. Okay, thank All you, right. thank, thank you. you. Okay. Yeah, Mark, thanks. Okay. I love how he recognized that he didn't really have a good way of testing. Well, I mean, like you said, he can think about that more, and maybe he'll come up with something. I mean, there, to be fair, there's a lot of people who have had difficult, like, hypotheses that had, when, sometimes when I see how somebody comes up with a way to demonstrate something, I'm amazed. Because there are many times when I've sat and, and, re, and seen something, like been reading about a theory or reading about a hypothesis, and I thought, oh my gosh, how would you even test that? Mm. And they come up with some idea that I'm like mind blown. Yeah. You know, here's how you can test it. And I thought, wow, that is so creative, that is so intelligent that someone came up with that mm -hmm. because I would be the worst person. If, if, I, if my job was to test hypotheses, we wouldn't know anything because I would just be like, I don't know. I don't know how you would test this. What I found interesting about that last call was that he didn't lead with the personal experiences that helped him through, I think he said he was struggling with addiction or something like that, substance abuse. And, and, and I'm not sure why you didn't lead with that, but it sounds like that was a big part of why you think that that's true. It might have been why he looked into it or how he got in, introduced to the ideas. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to, I understand what you're saying. I, I'm not going to go down the road of, you know, questioning uh, how he actually came to believe. But I, I, I felt like, you know, at least he did say that uh, if you could demonstrate some of these things were not what he thought, he would rethink the views mm -hmm. and he has looked mm -hmm. into this. And so, you know, I did appreciate that at least... Um, he would acknowledge that uh, oftentimes, yeah. much to my dismay, people will call in to argue a particular uh, apologetic, and it has nothing to do with why they believe what they believe. I mean, right. Even they're not convinced and that's, by that's it. That's why I like asking that question to see if we're, are we talking about something that really has an impact yeah. on your belief. And, there, and was, there was a huge element of honesty to Mark's call that yeah. we do not get from a lot of people that I, call exactly. to argue apologetics. Yeah, I hope that doesn't get overshadowed because yeah. yeah, that, was, that was good. Yeah. Okay, so let's see who else we've got here. I know that we've got one here that's been waiting for a while, so we'll go ahead and try this one. We have, uh, is it Avi in New Delhi? Hello, Avi, are you there? Can you hear me? 
Maybe he's muted. Line one, I've got it on. Avi, we'd like to talk to you. Oh my gosh, I don't want to lose your call because you've been waiting since the beginning of the show and I hope there's nothing really wrong here, but we'll give it a, a second. I don't know if the control... Hello? Hello? Hey, is this Avi? Hello? You're there. We hear yes. you. Hi. Hey. You're on. Hi. You're on with Tracy. Thank and you for anybody. holding. Thank you for holding. Let's get right to oh, it. Oh, uh, sorry. I think my internet connection is a little wobbly, and that's why I couldn't right. hear you guys. Well, then let's hurry before it goes out. Yeah. Uh, hey, by the way, how are you guys doing? We're doing good. Anthony's going to be the pirate why this am call. I, that doesn't even fit me. Oh, we'll see. But, uh, I I <laughs> wanted to say Anthony. There you go. That's so much better. Wow, because you had it on. Anthony, he's got something oh, to say. I'm sorry. I was focusing on Tracy. Yeah, sorry. Um, most of my questions uh, were going to be directed at how to approach people or how to talk to people. Okay. Um, okay. And I think I'll be looking into a lot of your videos and on uh, from those clips I watched. Cool. And uh, thank. Thank you for letting me know about all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, thank yeah, you for I'm thank you for your interest in watching it. Yeah, there's there's uh, I've got several hundred videos on my YouTube channel, and there are other people uploading content as well. So yeah, just do a. Search. So are you saying that Anthony uh, has been, kind of answered your question already, or are you just is that an additional thing? Oh, it's just an additional thing. Okay. Uh, especially in a country where the most religion kind of tends to just uh, rail off to just religions being uh, free to do whatever they want and people who don't have any religion or don't believe in a god are kind of set off to rail for kids. You know, it's harder to get uh, married, harder to get a will, harder to adopt a child. Because even in the forms that we fill up, like census forms, they don't have an option for no religion. It's just like six major religions and one others. Yeah. You're an atheist living in a largely religious community. Yeah. And so what is uh, what would you say your yes, question is so we can get the, to it? Um, my question is regarding, have you ever guys heard, uh, have you guys epistemic responsibility? You broke up a little there. Can you Epi repeat that? Oh. Uh, yeah, have you guys ever heard about epistemic responsibility? Um, I have. I have heard the term. Uh, go ahead and tell us uh, your view on it, and we can address it. I I, I kind of got into uh, this term from uh, researching this term because everywhere wherever I would to people, uh, I would usually get a bad comment about how. It's it's their opinion, and that's all that matters because oh. it's not hurting anyone. Okay, you okay. know, and um, this, this talk how even a little uh, wrong that you might think is not anybody is actual actually doing a lot of harm, even if you think that uh, it's not you are not being harmed, anyone else is not being harmed. Down the road, it may harm a lot of people, and even though you were not directly responsible, it is still your epistemic responsibility to acknowledge that. Are you talking about relativism, that everyone can have their own truth, or are you talking about something different? No, let me just take a stab. I think what you're yeah. saying, like, just you tell me if you're wrong, if this is wrong. But what I hear you saying is that you talk to people who say, "Hey, it's just my opinion; it doesn't hurt anybody. So what's the problem?" And what you're saying is you know, um, your opinion here, because it's not well-founded, could cause problems down the road. And you have to take some responsibility for the fact exactly. that, that you don't care about the truth of your beliefs and running around believing things, whether or not they're true, and not caring about that is, is, is a recipe for damage. You know? Yeah, like a parent who doesn't uh, think that uh, they're really harming anybody would, in turn, like me, uh, would go and make a child's brain more or uh, a uh, child's brain to struggle more with the studies. Like in sixth standard, I was taught how, uh, fifth, sixth standard, I was taught about evolution. But in my heart, I knew, well, um, <laughs> that wasn't true. Or in how tectonic plates cause, and I was like, yeah, that's some bullshit because Lord Shiva danced, and that's how okay. the earthquakes happen. I, because my parents taught me. So even though, at the time, like my parents didn't think about it, 
it kind of affected me along the way. That's what it gets into, right? Uh, you might think you're not causing any harm, but like even let's say that child goes on to become a minister in the cabinet and now imposing laws according mm. to his okay. own opinions or beliefs. Yeah, I do think that there are a lot of people who haven't given a lot of thought to to their views that everyone can have their own truth or um, if you just believe it, you make it true or giving everybody a pass and just saying, well, that's their opinion and they're entitled to it because these beliefs do motivate people to behave differently and, and act out on these beliefs. And yeah, it's frustrating. It's frustrating when you, you know, you're in an environment or you hear people encouraging that type of thinking. Um, I encounter that quite a bit when I, when I meet people who they believe in yeah, God, and, but they and, think everybody's God is correct and everyone, because everyone has a right to believe in it, therefore all of these beliefs are true. And that's a huge, yeah, that's a huge issue that, that, and I have some ideas on how to overcome that. We can get into that if you want, but. Can you do the bullet point okay. version? Yeah. I, yeah. Oh. Okay, so. Sorry, I cut you guys off. So if, if we're talking about this idea of wanting to get to a point where people value objective truth. Mm -hmm. Number one, most people do. For, for just off the top, even though people say that they don't, I do think people value truth in objective terms. That when push comes to shove, they can, not that I would shove anybody, but <laughs> they can recognize a difference between opinion and fact, okay? Um, and the easiest way to go about, I mean, a very simple way is to just say, you know, if I just think that that sucker is mine, mm -hmm. can I just make it mine and take it? Would you be okay No, with that? I would not be okay. Um, People usually can understand where you're going with that. Another thing that you can do, I, I, I'm starting to carry around this little box of Tic Tacs where I ask people if there's an odd number or an even number of total pieces of candy in the box. And some people will surprisingly say it can be both simultaneously. But we, we talk about how that can actually be possible and then the people usually start to realize that that's not the case. Um, you can ask a person a hard fact are armadillos live bearers or egg layers? It's one or the other. Um, whether I think that they're lay, uh, egg layers, if they're really live bearers, well then I would be mistaken on that. Like we, we both can't be correct. So fortunately, like I said at the start, people usually do value obje objective truth, even though they say that they don't. And if you up the stakes just a little bit, um, if you sort of involve maybe a loved one in the decision. Uh, you know, if, if I just think that putting my child in a car seat, uh, but not strapping it in, is safe, does it make it safe? Uh, usually around that point, people start coming around on it and realizing that, oh, okay, yeah, I, I just can't make something true just because I believe that it's true. So I, I, there, there are a couple ways around that. I made a blog post about that, too. Um, you can find that on the Street Epistemology website. You can check I think that. that baby car seat example is a really good one. I mean, Avi, have you tried things like that? Because I, I, don't I don't know if I have. I mean, um, definitely um, I give examples of harm, but that's a good one because no, people, people would be like, I'm not putting my baby in a car that's seat. That's the thing. People say that they live that way, but when you ask them a few simple questions, they discover that they don't. Right. Because they would never put a seatbelt on if they just could make it true in their <laughs> mind that I would be safe driving down the street. And with the baby, though, it's even worse because he's like, I probably would care more about the baby than myself, you know? <laughs> like, well, that's, that's, that's the interesting no, thing is, would, is a lot of people... It, 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 would, be a, it would be a great example. Uh, it's just that uh, down here, rarely anyone wears a seatbelt. I had a feeling you were going to go. <laughs> but, I mean, there's got to be certain things where they do something for the safety of a baby where you can... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now nah, we just okay. the baby, you know. If it gets into the fire, it'll learn. Yeah. No. You. Do you wow. seek out a doctor and give your baby medicine, or do you go to? No, they no, might yeah, actually be. No, I've had actually quite a lot of success. Family, um, uh, they have stopped calling me specifically to their like rituals in the family. They've stopped um, calling. I mean, you. they okay. do want me around. No, they do want me around. It's just I'm not forced to sit in one of those, okay. uh, which I usually really was forced to do every day and they had one. Maybe you could um, use the rituals as an example, right? Like um, if you, you know, if you're going to wave the feathers over the baby's head, but then not drop that last feather, 
you know, would you do that, mom? If you know, I mean, like, would they do the ritual wrong if they, you know, if they believed it was well, going to uh, help? I, I don't know. I, Maybe I, you could put it in terms they might. I once, I once did. I once did a very, very uh, crazy thing in front of my mom. She was like uh, praying to. Uh, to a goddess and I just got a loaf of bread and I friend of me and I started praying to it and she was like what are you doing and I was like well the same thing you are it's just that this will feed me in the end and that won't feed you <laughs> I pray for food and oh the loaf <laughs> yes. answers yeah that's a the good idea answered. exactly <laughs> okay and well i hope we were helpful has really opened up it sounds like you're the voice of reason in you your guys, household and i think it's good just try not to get too carried away with the antics where you end up pushing people away okay so just keep in mind that yeah i fear that all the time yeah I yeah because really i think they're i think they're very fortunate to have you around on. but um just be careful you don't go too far because you don't want them to yeah i'll be careful just fellowship you, you like the last a lot of help okay. Um, I watch your show all the time. Oh, this good. is my sick in time talk. Tracy. Oh, uh, I recognize your voice. I think I've listened to you, Colin. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I yeah. Oh, cool. Um, and like, I, I get arguments from you guys, especially the slavery argument I put forth in front of my French friend. He's, he was, he's from, uh, sorry, um, Columbia, uh, DRC, uh, Congo. He, his friend, uh, I, I asked him. And he's, uh, how could you believe in a God which essentially propagated slavery for for the entire uh, African continent? And uh, he it, it kind of got us talking and eventually he was thinking I'm the right person to talk about this. And I was like, yeah, most of the people say that. Okay. Because you don't really, you haven't actually even read your, your Bible carefully, <laughs> which I have. Well, I'm glad that it was helpful. Um, we do have to move on with some other calls, but I want to thank yes, you. Yes, of course. Sorry to. No, no, you're you're fine. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Harvey. Okay. Cool. It's, bye bye. Uh, great talking to you guys. Yeah, yeah. Take care. Bye. Same. Bye. Good night. Good night. Okay, this one has been holding since the beginning of the show, so let's go to Mitch in Illinois. Mitch, welcome. Hello. Hi. This How is are Tracy you? and Anthony. Hi, how you guys doing? Good. What's good. on your mind? What keeps you busy these days? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I like to watch you guys a lot, so so that keeps me kind of busy. That's a good, um, good use of your time, I but, suppose. Um, yeah. First things first, I just want to say um, what you said about uh, talking to strangers about sensitive topics earlier. Um, I just want to say that I, I I totally agree with that. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I totally agree with that because uh, you know because. Um, when you when you tell those sensitive topics to people you love, they could have like negative judgments on you, and then like estrangement and stuff could happen. So I, I agree with what you're talking about. Oh, you agree with the idea that it's easier to talk to a stranger about a sensitive topic than like a loved one? Yeah, that's what he's. Yeah, uh, correct. That's that t tends to be my personal experience as well. Like, yeah, usually people are more open uh, if they don't know who you are, uh, which is kind of unfortunate because. You know, usually the people that are learning these methods want to help the loved ones in their life and not necessarily some stranger that they've never met before. Yeah, right. Totally correct. You know, I, uh, I had a, a conversation with a guy this summer at uh, one of my friends, uh, his apartment pool. Uh, there was another guy there and we just had like an hour and a half conversation about um, the different topics related to religion. Um, mm, but good. what I wanted to get into real quick... Um, I just wanted to say uh, I love your guys' show. Um, uh, you guys kind of helped me like rewire my brain, if that makes any sense. Sounds scary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little bit, but it was it's it's been kind of fun just um, being able to learn so much more and being open minded and stuff. Um, what would you say is the main happy. thing? What was this, what would you say is the main thing that you changed on from having watched their show? Um. Actually, that's that's one of the things I wanted to get into real quick. Um, well, I'll just answer that real quick. The first thing, or probably the hardest thing to get rid of was uh, the, the concept of the afterlife. Um, Scary thought, living was, forever. No, I, I think I know where you're going. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was never really I was never really scared of death or, like, afraid of hell or anything, but um, I was raised Catholic. 
Um, we were, or my, my family's pretty liberal and I was raised in a liberal town. So it was never, never really crazy. We all just kind of like, everyone has their beliefs, you know, everyone's cool with it, whatever. Um, but I, I think my parents were just kind of liberal with it because my, my grandparents forced my dad into Catholic school when he was a kid. So they were just kind of lackadaisical on it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I only had like my first communion when I was in second grade. So it, it was never really a huge part of my family life. Okay. Um, but and you're, I, I do you're still struggling today with uh, this whole idea of there not being an afterlife, more than likely. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm I'm over that now. Yeah, I. Oh okay. I'm. He was just saying that's one of the things that he thinks was a big deal that changed. But you actually have a different topic for today, right? Uh, yeah. I just I wanted to uh, just give a little background, you know, about uh, how you guys helped me, and then um, I wanted to actually bring to your attention if you didn't know. Um, if you hadn't heard about it already, there's, I think it was 2016, there was an article and, uh, a, um, a video published of, uh, hypothesized, uh, chimpanzee religious rituals in, um, I can't remember where they said, obviously somewhere in Africa, but, um, they, they had recorded, uh, I think it was multiple different tribes, if you will, of chimpanzees, um, like running up some tree and like banging on the tree and throwing rocks at it and uh, howling at it and doing different things, which might be what they hypothesize as religious rituals. So I just, I wanted to bring that to your attention because I thought it was mm. pretty cool. Yeah, it would be really hard to demonstrate the motivation behind chimpanzee behavior. I, um, I remember back when I was in college, there was the observations, I think it was Jane Goodall who first first observed, but other people I think have since, that chimpanzees make, uh, th- gener- they react with threat behavior to storms, right? So if there's like a thunder cloud and, you know, lightning, and st- that freaks them out. And because they're scared, they react with threatening behavior. So they'll grab branches and shake them at the storm and scream and do the, the, the things they would normally do to other chimpanzees that they're trying to intimidate. So they definitely appear to yeah, uh, I, I look at threats at, in, a, in a way that, that uh, mimics the same way that they would look at uh, agent threats, right? So non-agent threat, agent threat, they seem to behave in a similar fashion, which makes a person kind of wonder, you know, are they, are they looking at this storm as some sort of an agent, something they can scare away? And you're right. describing like, behavior toward like, a tree. <laughs> That's a little bit weird. You know, like, what are they doing with this tree? Um, I hope that one day we can actually establish, you know, what would be the, the, the motivation behind it. But certainly it's, uh, it's intriguing to see an animal act like, you know, g- behave as though something is an agent that isn't. Um, and, it, and it does certainly put us, I think, in mind of, of early religious beliefs and even some religious beliefs that still exist today uh, that are a little bit animistic, where people in, endow inanimate things or natural things with uh, agency, right? Um, so I understand yeah. what you're describing. I'm actually uh, really fascinated about like the whole early religions and like uh, Sumerians and the Egyptian stuff. So I think all that is uh, actually really, really cool. Um, and, uh, possibly because that's, I think what broke my quote unquote faith, if you will. Okay. Um, uh, cause I, uh, I, I had kind of been on the fence about it after watching your guys show for a while. And then I just saw, I have seen a video sometime last year. Um, I think it was just called like the origins of religion or something. And it had explained how it would all come from animism and like, you know, cause of pattern seeking minds and stuff. So, um, I just wanted to thank you guys for uh, all the things you're doing and um, uh, the, the the help you're bringing to people. So well, thank you for your call. Even, even people, yeah, even people that aren't you know extremely religious like like I was. So okay, uh, thank you, thank you a bunch, and I hope all I right. can come down and visit sometime. Yeah, feel free. We have the dinner afterwards. All right, thank you, Mitch. Oh. Don't have too all much right, to add to that it. one. I um, have no experience in that field at all. Okay. Other than maybe just being a little cautious not to draw too many conclusions from a study. As much as it, we would like to be able to say uh, that these things are an evolved trait, oh, mm-hmm. you know, 
uh, we have to be a little cautious on those. Yeah, studies. absolutely. I, I think these are mainly hypotheses, you know, people that, and we would have to find ways to explore them in more depth. We have a caller who uh, definitely is on track with your street epistemology on line four. So let's go ahead and talk with, is it Al, Al from Chicago? Yes. How are you? Good to speak with you. Hi, Al. Hello. Chicago, huh? Yes, indeed. This is the third Illinois person. I was going to say, Illinois is representing today. I noticed that myself. <laughs> yeah. Ironically, I'm from yeah, that area. Absolutely. Okay. I, I doubt that's the reason why, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that well, you called. I am. Yeah, I, well, I'm just so happy to see that your street epistemology is gaining some traction, especially in this very chaotic and uh, just very polarizing time. Um, I'm just curious, have you found the difference when you speak uh, this model with American Muslims, or have you had a lot of those in the past? I do run into a fair amount of Muslims. Generally, this, the, the very same reasons that I hear from Christians are the reasons that Muslims will say that their God is real. They tend to be a little bit more tied to their book. It's not so much personal experiences and miracles as it is my book is consistent with reality. But I do get the same thing from from Hindus and Christians as well. But when you keep okay. peeling back the layers, even with Muslims, they appeal to faith for the way that they are coming to know that their God is real. So in that, in that area, it's the same. Like there's a lot of similarity. And when I talk to a Muslim, I don't know anything about the Quran. I know as much about the Quran as I do about right. monkeys yelling at lightning storms or whatever the last call of the chimpanzee is. I know nothing about it, and, but that's, that's a good thing. It's advantageous to be ignorant on a topic when you're using SE because you want to ask questions and figure it out and have the person explain to you how they're so sure. So while I don't run into a lot of Muslims here in Texas, there are quite a few, but there's really no difference between the justifications that I hear. Sure. Uh, well, I, I, I'm an ex-Muslim myself. I, I think I would have been super, super scared to uh, move out of my faith. But I, I definitely think that if you caught me as, as a teen, I would have been feeling like, oh, well, I'm not 100 percent sure. And uh, I think I would have uh, I think I would have benefited quite a bit more than the, uh, the kinds of things that came at me. Uh, as a young person. Um, High five! So I'm, just, what, <laughs> I'm in the what? same club, so yeah, I understand. On that note uh, about yeah. similarities and differences, uh, one, one thing that I'm noticing is regardless of the belief, if somebody's younger, they tend to be more open to examining their belief and, and possibly revising it yeah. and finding community that, that will support them and be there for them. But like he's describing, also more vulnerable to people who would like to get them to close up their views and wrap that up, you know? I, I mean, when you get the wrong people that get oh, a hold yeah. of that person, they can really shut it down. And I think yep. uh, that's what you were describing, Al, is, is, is what happened to you as a teen. And I, if I understood you right, that was kind of my way of saying, yeah, me too. That's what happened to me. They got me right at that age. Yeah, I see a lot of this in universities where it's, it's a ripe ground for, for people who are vulnerable mm -hmm. and they're looking for community and they're scared and they're away from their families for the first time. And there are organizations, usually religious ones, that they see that as an opportunity to push their message. And that's why I'm so excited about having, there's, there's members from the Secular Student Alliance here. Okay. That is a good, that is a good response to these groups. And, and I think uh, one direction that we need to move in with street epistemology is, is engaging with people in the SSA so that they're aware of this, so that they can, they can question mm -hmm. these people who are on campus. And I'm not just focusing on Christian organizations. There are, there's the Muslim Student Association. They're making truth claims and they're trying to get they're trying to bring these vulnerable people into their groups at a young age. And this yep. is exactly the time and the venue for those folks to be questioning. So I would love to see more people in the SSA familiar with this method and start pushing back a little more. A little more than just ask an atheist day, but <laughs> converse with an atheist yeah. day. Sure. Um, that, that's, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you all the way on that, both of you. One thing for Tracy, um, and hi. Uh, what would your response be to this comment? This is a, this is my one last question. It's uh, it's not related to that, but uh, 
would you think that it would be a false equivocation to say that it's similar how people will cover up or avoid the conversation about the Harvey Weinstein situation as people would find covering up or being afraid to talk about religious leaders and what they do? Do you see a similarity or am I, am I way off? Are you talking about the people who, like, at the time, obviously the cover's blown, but are you talking about people who were covering at the time, like, afraid to discuss it at the time? Yeah, those... Uh, like, while it was ongoing right. and before it came out. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, would ha I have not thought of that before. Like, this is the first time I've been presented with that question, so I haven't really, in my mind, related those things. I would think that the people with Weinstein... Um, I think the people with Weinstein were aware of what was going on for the most part from what I've read. Obviously, I don't, I don't have any firsthand information about this situation, but it sounded like that what they were describing is that people knew about it, but that most people were intimidated by his power. And when sure. it comes to the religious leaders, while they do have power and they can be intimidating, I think they also, though, have a lot of credibility that has to be torn away before anybody will even believe that they've done such a thing. My understanding with Weinstein, again, this is just, I'm using like a high, general, broad general thing of this is what the story seemed to be, was that people were aware but afraid to do anything about it. Whereas in religion, I think there may be some people that are aware, but they're covering it up actively to the point that other people don't believe the person's doing it. You know what I mean? I don't think there were a bunch of people that thought sure. Weinstein was innocent, but I think when it comes to a religious leader, you probably get a lot of the congregation who gets angry at the victim because they think that this religious leader um, would never do such a thing. And sure. I think that it would be different on that front, but I don't know on what aspects you're comparing, so it's hard to answer. No, that's a very concise way to put it. Yeah. Okay. That's that's quite a. Uh, that's really it, and I'm I'm so grateful to be on air with you guys, and thanks so much, Tracy and Anthony, for okay. your time. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your call. Okay, we're gonna just head on down the list. We're gonna hit Dan in Winslow, Maine. Hello, Dan. This is Tracy and Anthony. It says you're a recent atheist. Hi, Tracy. Hey. Uh, <laughs> thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um. What I, do. I, I'm a recent uh, recovering Catholic, and um, I have uh, some questions about beliefs. Um, my mom is an organist. I've been singing with her for about 30 years, and I still do go to church. However, um, I was confirmed at 16 into the Catholic Church based on instructions from other Catholics, and I'm sort of starting to realize that belief based on just what you've been told, I, I don't really accept it as belief. Uh, at least that's what I'm coming to now. Um, I don't think I really it? believe something until, uh, well, I, acceptance of instruction is, it, it can only take you so far. I think. It's training, right? It's I mean, you're describing training. You could call it brainwashing uh, or something like that. Um, but I would like to know, you know, if, if what's true belief, how far can the, I mean, I was confirmed. I said, yes, I believe this stuff. Um, but it's never been borne out in reality. Um, you know, I, I've done some talks recently about this topic, so I'm going to hit this. And I, I think that it may be the wrong direction to go to say that it's not a true belief, okay? I know what you're describing because that's what it feels like when you come out of it. You think my beliefs now are different than my beliefs then. And I think that that is correct, right? So you had different uh, evaluations for what you believed previously, which was no evaluation. And then you have now beliefs built on evaluating evidence and drawing a conclusion. And so this feels different to you. It's a different experience of getting to the idea that this is true. And so you're saying sure. they're not like the, the same. Turned on finally. Right. But when it comes to belief, all they're asking is, do you hold this as true? And I would say that the, the wrong way to look at it is to say, 
yes, I did, but it's not a belief because it's, that's going to cause more problems than solutions. So I would say let's go ahead and call them both beliefs, but let's look at the processes involved in reaching them because that's where the difference really lies. It's not in whether or not you thought it was true because they're going to be the same at that point. You can't go up to somebody who has um, not well developed their belief and tell them that they don't hold this as true because they're going to tell you that they do and then it's going to be a useless conversation. Or that it's not a belief. Right. They're going to, sure. I mean, it, they do think it's true, um, but they think it's true for a different set of reasons. What I talked about quickly was identity development in people and how do we come to the idea that we associate ourselves with certain beliefs, right? How do I determine that I associate with the Italian-American community or that I say, you know, I don't really associate with them. How do I identify? Do I identify with that community? Or do I identify as an atheist? Or do I identify as an agnostic? Or do I identify as a project manager? Or do I, you know, do I identify as a mother, as a wife? Um, all these things that you can incorporate into your identity of who you are. And in some cases, we develop an identity that is called foreclosed, right? Where what happens is you, you're adopting an identity based on expectations and based on um, basically what you should be believing. And then there's another sure. type of identity which goes through what is called, what used to be called the identity crisis, right? And it doesn't mean that you're freaking oh, out. Sure. It only means yeah. um, what Anthony was talking about. You hit this stage in your life where suddenly you're hit with, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because you're about to grow up. So what job do you want? Do you want to get married? Mm -hmm. Do you want to have kids? Do you, there's this point in your life where suddenly these questions become very real and you are expected to explore these questions. But in some cases, people don't give you the opportunity to explore. They simply hand you the answers and say, go forth with these answers. Sure. And people do. And the people that well, do uh, that... In my case, uh, along with the, well, exploring that, uh, in my personal case, I'm a choir member. My mom's the the uh, choir director. I went to church. I just went with the flow. I was involved, and I did that. But I never really did investigate what I was taught. Right. Mm -hmm. I never really even thought about it. I just mm -hmm. went along with it. Yeah. I, I was enjoyed just... singing. I still do, honestly. But I, when I go to church now, I, and I'm really only doing it because it's fulfilling to my mom. She's elderly, and she still plays. I understand. And I want to be there for her as long as I can. But when I go to church now, I, it's completely different. I mean, it's uh, it's hard to describe, but it's I in no way believe any of this stuff anymore. And, right. and uh, I feel like a hypocrite going there. I'm, I feel like I'm covering for... Yeah, yeah the feeling but, of hypocrisy you know. is interesting, too, and it's part of it. Basically, what's happening is you have this identity that is like the real identity that you experience and that you have come to based on actually evaluating things. And it's in conflict with this other identity, which is the identity that you feel like you have to put on to make mom happy. And so you feel this <laughs> yeah. conflict and you're saying, I feel like a hypocrite. I feel uncomfortable when I go to church and I know I don't believe this. And this is what plagues a person. This is what's wrong with the foreclosed identity, is that the person is constantly going to be fighting conflicts between what they really identify with and what they're trying to, and they're suppressing that, and they're trying to maintain this other identity that is like this surface structure that they've adopted because it's what's expected. And you, you, the more, the longer you maintain it, the more you just have to keep fighting this conflict that's never going to go away because you're never going to be sure. what you're not. And that's what yeah. you're describing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've already kind of decided on my, my path ahead. Uh, when my mom decides to retire from playing, I will no longer be going to church. Um, and that will probably upset some of my family, but not <laughs> others. I have atheists in my family, and I have, I have fundamentalists in my family. So it's going to be an interesting ride. But um, I am putting, you know, I'm, I'm, I've decided not to have a conversation with my mom unless she directly asks me. And that, that at that point may change my relationship with my mom. Yeah, I don't know. Everyone has um, to make but, those decisions on their own because we all have to live with the with the fallout from whatever we do or don't do. Yeah. yeah. But as far as my belief it prior, uh, for the, you know, during my years of non-investigating this stuff, 
Um, I suppose I could call it belief. I don't really want to. I'm kind of ashamed now that I actually believe that stuff. Um, but now having seen the light, I mean, it was your show and it was Christopher Hitchens and Rich Dawkins and Intelligence Squared debates that did it for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when the lights went on, they just, it's not ever going to go out. So. Yeah, I would, if you want, you can look up foreclosed identity and you'll probably find a lot of information yeah. that you'll relate to. And it, yeah. will, I, I think that, like I said, I would, I would go ahead and just consider them all beliefs, but I would, uh, you know, look at the processes and the differences there. Yeah. Great. Well, all right. thank you very much. You have a great show, and I very, appreciate, very much appreciate the work that you guys do. Well, thanks very thank much you. for your thank call. Thank you. Thank you. This reminds Take me of, of a talk that I gave to Chicago Atheist Society, where I, I sort of build a stack of blocks to to show how you have the person, you have these beliefs, and then mm-hmm. here are all the justifications, and right. then there's all these other things that motivate them. And I and I, I have this green block, and I it's going to look weird because of our green screen. Oh, but. <laughs> it's the it's the, there you go the transcendent yeah, block. This this is the most important part. This is the person. And, and the beliefs are separate from the individual, but these deeply held beliefs are so tied to a person's identity that it is often hard for a person to separate those cherished beliefs from their sense of self. Well, yeah. And I you mean, have to be the, delicate when you challenge those beliefs because people will feel attacked. The values and the beliefs actually are our identity. When those change, our identity changes. Yeah. So it's, I mean, if I were to, like, for example, move from being an atheist to a Christian, that would not, that would be a, a change... In, in my val- my values, my beliefs, like it would be sure. literally a shift in my identity. Sure. And I would say I identify as this and now and your, not your as your social this. group that you're a part of, uh, right. th- that moral community that right. you'd, you'd have to move from one community to another. Yeah, it's challenging. But sometimes those, um, the things that we adopt are going to be in conflict, like in, mm. in a conflict with who we are. So for, we hear this a lot from people who are raised fundamentalists who, for example, are gay. Those people can say all day, <laughs> you know, that, no, I'm a Christian and I'm straight, or, you know, I just battle these same-sex urges, but I'm not you gay. Go through so, yeah, um, people and, are very good at jumping through And hoops. you will battle that your whole life, probably. You know, the odds are that you will continue to battle that because it's not, that conflict is not going to stop. And Christians will basically say that, oh, that's the conflict between your evil natural self and this, you know, Christ-like veneer that you're supposed right. to put that's out. That's just the sin. This is how they get you to foreclose, right? They get you to say, like, oh, yes, I need to be this, and I need to just suppress who I really am, like, really hard. And then you end up with problems. What kind of life is that? It's a horrible, yourself. horrible life. Be yourself. Okay, so Place we just have truth. a couple more calls. We're just a few minutes late, but let's go ahead and see if we can take them. Um, we'll go ahead. I'm just going to mention one more time that after the show, we are going to Star of India. And so if they want to put the address up there, people are, you know, welcome to come. Um, but we let's go quite ahead. A group and out there too. We're going to hit uh, one of the last two calls here. This is going to be, let's say, try this one. This is Robin in Detroit. Hey, Robin. Yeah, Robin is my last name. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, we won't name? say we won't say your first name just so we don't give you oh, know, your whole yeah. identity away. Good, good point. <laughs> Glad you cut me off. I don't. I don't care. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, I was uh, a theist for the first like six years of uh, my life once I was like going to private school. And um, within two years of moving and then going to public school, I was pretty much already critically thinking and identifying as an atheist, even though I wasn't familiar with the term. I told people I wasn't an atheist, even though I guess I was, because <laughs> I just didn't know what the word meant. You, like and, you and tons of people. This so, sounds yeah. like my story, like literally. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> go, ahead. go ahead. This yeah, is about I'm you. Sure it happens. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, after, like, all that, I kind of strengthened my opinions. I did research. I tried to politely converse and debate with uh, my classmates, friends, teachers, and everything. Um, So that's just kind of like a little backstory. So what I really want to talk about is uh, AA, uh, because I've only heard it talked about once uh, on the show before, and whether or not either of you have been to meetings and just kind of your overall view towards it uh, and support groups like that and how the government kind of, like, sanctions people to them and why they don't get referred to other focus groups when AA has such a low success rate. I have friends who have done, you know, gone through AA, and they have varying perspectives, right? So some of them are like, I wanted no part of it, and I felt really ostracized because I didn't do the higher power thing. And then there's other people who are like, you know, I just went along with the higher power thing, but I, you know, I just picked whatever. My love for my family was my higher power. I mean, so it was, and I've also heard that the group that you're in makes a big difference. 
you know, the, the, exactly. and who's your sponsor and stuff like that. So um, while I definitely would love to see more secular responses to treatment, um, and I know that uh, there are some court battles that went through with, uh, and I don't know if it was AA specifically, but like there were some court battles about people that were sent to religious rehabs and things like that, that they actually were able to successfully sue and say, I, I need secular treatment because this is a violation of my, you know, my religious views. Yeah, that as well. Um, wow, okay, that's cool. So I, uh, I mean, I have obvious concerns about it. There's also a whole other spectrum of how uh, how useful AA is as a recovery tool, whether or not it actually works. Um, I think that there's right. problems with how they track the data that I've seen before. But I'm not that savvy on you know how good or how bad that really is. Um, and like I say, yeah. some people are like, I got plenty of support from it and it was helpful to me. And I know other people who were just like, it did nothing for me. Um, and I just basically sure. got off alcohol on my own. Um, so what, I mean, what are your thoughts? Well, um, I have two DUIs actually under my record, and uh, I just went to an AA meeting recently. I actually don't have a problem with alcohol. I just had a couple of DUIs that were really bad. So the main reason I wanted to go to this AA meeting with my mom the other day is because she's been in it for a long time, and I kind of wanted to just get like some new stories, new perspectives on things. And the table I was at actually didn't even talk about God at all, and I got more from that cool. meeting than out of the other eight meetings wow. that I went to that I had to go to for court. Before I got more out of just that one meeting than up the eight other ones. So that was really cool. Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was really nice. But the problem is, is that I already know that if I would had sat at a different table, it could have been the exact opposite experience. Right, right. Yeah. And there may be people that so, will never go back because they had a bad experience. I'm, I'm thinking that as the population yeah. becomes more secular, we'll start to see more secular resources for people that are struggling with, with those addictions. I just did a Google search and I was able to find a few things. Um, secular sobriety is. too. Secular sobriety is one. Have, have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Or at least it looks like it's a good one. Okay. I don't know much about it, but it looks like a good one in the two seconds. The website that I looks Google. nice, so it must be good. <laughs> no, be skeptical. Look into it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, I, I uh, you know, try to try to take it seriously. I mean, some people do have some issues with it. It sounds like you, your mother is also struggling with this, so family history can play into this. And a um, couple DUIs. Yeah you may want to just kind of take it a little bit more seriously. Um, consider that oh, yeah, you may sure. actually, you know, have an issue that you might want to deal with. But I would say, you know... Yeah, well, the problem that I have with alcohol is the fact that it messed up my life and not that I actually have an addiction to it. And that's possible, so, too. There are some people know, that don't understand that there's a, there's a difference between um, abusing a substance and, and being addicted to a substance. And very, some people true, kind, of, kind of abuse I definitely abused alcohol. I can't yeah. say that I didn't. Yeah. So I understand what you're describing, and, and I think there is some validity to that. Although I am not an addiction counselor, so <laughs> no, no, definitely not. But I just because okay. I've only heard it once discussed before, and I actually had an even better topic yesterday. I didn't write it down. I forgot this, what it was. That topic <laughs> seems to come up a lot on this show. Honestly, I I, th I seem to remember really? Matt talking about it quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, Matt. I think Matt talked about last time I was. He has well, pretty I was strong say feelings. Last time I was on, but it must have been when I was watching because I'm not on yeah, with I think Matt, Matt has anymore. Some pretty sad. Strong. You're not on anymore with Matt. No, I can't because when now I host, so oh, oh. we can't be on. Are like the dream together team. anymore. It's <laughs> that is sad. Yeah. I see a lot of people asking when Matt's going to be back too, and I'm I'm kind of telling he's been them like he's busy. He's, he's gallivanting he's all over the world and everything because it gives yeah it gives you guys a chance to get more comfortable with the show and have more guests like this on that really have different you know perspectives on things that people need to hear, and it also gives them a chance to maybe some people don't like watching Matt as much, you know, because he kind of takes over the show. So maybe he, you know, people oh. actually like to watch other hosts and hostesses too. Wow. A compliment and an insult. Uh, oh, wow. I am the captain now. I be the captain of this show. So, yeah. Um, no, that actually, thank you for the prod because that reminds me that uh, I will be with Matt, in fact, in Vancouver in the first few days of November. Cool. Uh, so we're going to be there at a, at, a, at a Reason event in Vancouver. And uh, I believe that uh, I, if I haven't posted about it on the blog, I need to. So I might go ahead and do that. Just there you go. You can get a fix that. there. Um, yeah, so check that out. And uh, 
I thought we did have another call, and now there's something so. ringing. But Two. I'm going to let you go, Rob. Uh, did you want to do? Robin? A, <laughs> did you want to do a question from the audience? Oh, you know what? We, we, we can. We're talking, we are told I don't know if we you can do. To. do you if to if the studio wants to do a question from the audience, we can do a question from the audience and test that out because we were told we could test that out this I'm, week. I'm I'm forty percent confident this is going to work. I'm going to let you go, Robin. Oh yeah, thanks for calling. No problem. <laughs> what the hell's going on? Am I off? And we may or may not have a caller on one. I don't know. We're they're working on it. But if we okay. can do an audience question, we'll do one of those. And if the caller on one does not materialize, then we'll go to dinner. I am hungry. Oh, see, we need to go. The, the lollipops are not cutting. Well, I haven't eaten. It's not I'm just, sufficient. Yeah. I've been eating mine. Uh, I'm like totally there. Yeah. Happy Halloween, Art. I don't want the microphones picking up me slurping on it. Put the hat on right. It doesn't. Don't put. It does fit if you put it on right. Okay. Here see. Okay, that kind of does fit. Now I really wish I brought yeah, mine. We have a question. Okay, we got a question. Oh Looks good. You like? See, like good pirate. Oh. Anthony, can you hear me? Yes. I, I have a, a friend who's asking if you managed to get your atheist license plate. A friend is asking if they got their atheist license plate. If you were able to get your atheist license oh, plate. Oh, I was able to. I did get it. Yeah, well, I was trying to get okay. it. I, I managed to get it from David Smalley. Had it. You ever see his truck? It had the atheist license plate on it. Yeah. So he recently moved to California. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, it's a shame that we're losing an atheist in Texas. And I was like, he doesn't need that license plate anymore. So I reached out to him, and, and I was able to get it from him. Very Yeah, so cool. I do have it. It's not on my vehicle, though. Where I'm, is it? It's, it's, <laughs> in a, it's in a safe in my house. Only because I want to wait till my kids get a little older before I start tooling around in a car, and I'm driving their friends around and all this stuff. I don't want to, like, force my Now, view. wait a minute. Did you apply for this tag, like, through the DMV? Yeah. And you got it? Yeah. And you don't put it on your car? Uh, not yet. I will. <laughs> I'm I think like, you kind of have to. I'm squatting on it right now. Okay, because I think it's the law. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't. You have the option of using it or not on a vehicle. A you tag? A license plate. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to put it on a vehicle. Oh, so you just got like an extra I I, look. Wow. I, okay, yeah. I did not know yeah. this. You can get a license plate. I learned it's a, it's something a vanity plate, just now. And Weird. You, you have the option of assigning it to a vehicle or not. I've never so even... I'm who would just, even think to get a license plate for not, not a vehicle? I'm going that to use it for a vehicle so eventually. so wild that they even allow that. I guess they sell more tags. Who would have thought this would be the most controversial question... Wild. ...of the show? You want to take another one? Sure. Uh, hi, James from Kansas City. I'm actually here with my wife and my son. Um, and my question is, what is the best way to talk to people who keep on bringing up your son's such a blessing and how can you not believe in God now because you have a kid and the, the, I have my typical answer, but I'm guess I'm more looking for the more respectful answer. Uh, mm. via so that I don't keep losing family members. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so funny how adding kids, you know, to your family brings out all these big questions of life. People have, they, they want to share their views with you. They want you to believe what they believe. You know, it could be delicate, especially if this is a mother, but if, if it's a friend or, or, or a coworker or whatever, you could just say that, you know, we, we just don't, this is just not something that we believe in. Do they know this? Do they know that you don't believe? They know this and they still say that. Yeah, I, I that, mean, that could be a little off-putting. I, I guess in my mind, I would have to see the context because some people are going to say it just because they think it's a good thing to say, even no matter what you think. And like they just are still think it's like I'm being nice, but then there's other people who it's like yeah, I'm not sure you're being nice, right? Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> will say it, and they they don't they forgot that you don't believe, or yeah, it's just it's just a it's, it's a pleasantry, right? Yeah. It's just it's just the platitude that they're saying. But yeah, if they're being aggressive about it, then I would might I might just pull them aside and just say you know can we can we talk about why you think that this belief is true? I wouldn't get into. I, this is my parental right, and I'm doing what, you know, there, there's no proof for this God. F figure out how they're so sure. I mean, do you want to talk to them about it, or do you just want to get them to stop saying things like that? <laughs> like, he yeah, he's not interested away. in engaging. He just wants a nice way to respond to it so that they will stop saying those types of things. Frankly, inviting them to discuss why they believe that it's true might be one of the ways to... to You're not going to get out of it. You have to engage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people that make these these platitudes and say these things are probably 
not as confident in the belief that they that they say that they are. So wow. use it as an opportunity to have a conversation with them, but wait till after the birthday party before you do it. Like find a nice quiet time. Venue is very important for these discussions. One more question, maybe. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, this is Tim from the Secular Student Alliance. Uh, hi. Just a member. Um, I have recently made friends with uh, officers and the president of a uh, Christian apologetics club at Baylor. And we've uh, used that as an opportunity to have a conversation with them and sort of build bridges and, and, and make better conversations. Um, but there's a bit of a conflict because while our purpose is to have a conversation, the purpose of their club is to make Christian apologetics palatable and look good. And so when I'm when I'm having a conversation with the president outside of the club, he's very I mean, he's very uh, reflective and intellectually honest. Mm -hmm. But when he's in front of the club, mm -hmm. he has a duty to the club to not wow. charitably interpret my arguments yeah. in wow. those moments. Uh, and 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 I I think on some level he might be aware of this, but it's not really important. What I'm I'm, I'm curious, there's a wide range of people in that group, some of them hardcore creationists and some of them more towards the side. Now, I was sort of in response to what Anthony was saying earlier, how, um, sorry, getting lost in my thoughts, um, how it would be beneficial to reach people before they get so, uh, so to speak, um, caught in that moment. Either you're at college, you're reflecting, you're, you know, um, searching, and th this is a very, this is one of those places where that intellectual curiosity can be shut down, and we're trying to come in and, you know, give it an air of intellectual honesty. Um, do you have any advice on on how to do that in the best way possible, and in, in, in the in the most mm in the way that's most available to everyone in the room when, when I go in. And, and it's difficult because the club's purpose is to not, yeah. you know, have that much honesty going right, on. Right, right, gotcha. Yeah, this kind of goes back to the previous question where I think venue is so important, all right? Like, people will be more honest with themselves and with you if, if you can create a safe environment for them to feel like they can tell you exactly why they believe these things and, and, and be as honest as possible. When they're in a room full of 30 people who believe in God, they're gonna likely be less likely to be honest with you about it. So, so my advice would be to, to just have one-off conversations with people. It, it's the same advice that I, that I would give like the guy that goes out to talk about Jesus, one of the first callers that we had. It's so much better than to just preach and be yelling at people, but just just have a dialogue. If you've, what you think is true, you know, I think is the way to go. I have a question. I have a question. Um, oh, I'm dropping my earphone. I'm just gonna let it go. I can hear from the other one. Um, I agree with what Anthony is saying, but I wonder what would happen. Like, have you gone up to this person and said? I really would love to continue these dialogues, but I'm getting tired of the fact that when we have a conversation, you're completely honest and open with me, and then we get in front of your group, and you're like an entirely different person, and I feel like I'm being abused in some way or used in some way that you know you don't present yourself the same with me as you do in front of these people. That's a, I, I, I and, think that's a good way to go and about it. And I would like to continue these dialogues, but I can only do that if you're willing to be the same open, honest person in front of these in front of your peers as you are when you have a conversation with me. Do you think that you can do this? Yeah, well, we are friends, and I think he would be more responsive to me uh, if I asked that now than if I had asked that when we first met. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a struggle because I think he has two goals. He does want to have an honest conversation with me. He does want to reach me where I'm sure. at. Mm -hmm. But he also, f he founded the group. He wants, it's his baby. He wants it to be a Christian apologetics group right. that makes it look good. And so there's just a conflict of interest in his yeah. head. And, and But real. you're saying that you're involved in this, though, yes. right? Okay, yes. and that's the thing. I mean, he can't, he can't have the cake and eat it, too. He's it, doing it, it a service to his other, the members of his group, too, by, by being, well, I hate to say two-faced, but by presenting one face to you. It is two-faced. 
I mean, it really is. It's it's almost like the Scarlet Letter, right? Like mm -hmm. he he cares about her and he wants to be with her and he he you know he's he was okay doing what he did, but then when the congregation wants to go and torture her, he's just like, oh yeah, I got nothing to say now, you know. And it's it's not that he doesn't like her or that he thinks ill of her. He loves her, but he's just you know he's scared and pressured and intimidated and conforming in front of this this group of people that he's not going to come out and be the person who would yeah. want to defend her. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is the thing. It's like if if you would just call him out on it and just say that you appreciate the the, re the real conversations that you have with him, and if that can extend into the the group setting, you're happy to keep going with it. But right now, what you're getting isn't the same person in front of the group as you're getting one on one, and it, you can't continue to to be a participant with this if that's how it's going to be. It's quite telling that he's reluctant to have those detailed conversations that he does that he has with you in public amongst his peers, because if he had, you would think his peers would have the answers that he's lacking. So maybe at some level he realizes that this group doesn't have those answers. We went to a, an Islam 101 session that was like a, a weekend thing, like a, it was like a Saturday or something. We did all day Saturday, me and a few other people, and we went there. And the, they gave us this big presentation, we had lunch, and then we went back, had more presentation, and then they allowed for questions, right? So they were like taking questions. And the imam who serves the mosque was in charge of it, and he took our questions. I was completely blown away with how honest he was with his responses. There were times when he was just like, that's a really tough question, and I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, he was very, very willing to say, I don't know, or I would try to do this, I think, but that would be a hard situation to have to deal with, or I would, you know, if we had to cope with it. I mean, there were so many things that I could tell that this was the first time he was hearing these questions, but he didn't just try to, you know, dance, dog and pony show it away. He really sat down and said, let me think about this for a second and try to answer this. And he's in front of his congregation, basically, right? And he's not afraid to say, here's what I'm thinking off the cuff, you know, that I might try to do. Really, I appreciated that so much. Yeah, I so, respect that. Yeah, you can't, I, I, I can't really blame it. I mean, I agree with Anthony that the guy feels like it's a more intimidating situation and not as necessarily friendly, which is weird because these are his <laughs> peeps. But... At the same time, this imam can be open like that and honest, so why can't this guy? You know, it's not an excuse. I have a similar situation going on with a guy who's a, who's a, he's a higher up at Crew, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. It's an online Christian ministry. We have these great discussions on Facebook, but when my questions get a little bit too challenging, he will message me so that we can continue the discussion because he's not comfortable with it playing out in front of his peers. And I think it speaks volumes to his confidence in what he's saying. Yeah. And, and it's, it's an interesting thing to see. That is a huge red flag for me. I have so much disrespect for a conversation that's happening in a public space when somebody then subversively tries to get into a one-on-one -on -one with me. There are some situations where I understand that. Like somebody will say to me, I have a comment that I want to make, but it's extremely private and personal, and I'm not comfortable saying it publicly. I get that 100%. I mm -hmm. understand. But when somebody just simply tries to shift that argument to a private space, it's like, nope, you, we're on that thread. You need to go back to that thread, and you need to respond to that thread if you want me to well, respond to and that. I, and I think the motivation for wanting to move it into a private sphere was so that his colleagues wouldn't see that he was taking a more liberal stance on, this, on doctrine than the others, and then he'd have to spend so much time justifying it. But it just highlights how, yeah. how people... Um, it's just not honest. I see it yeah, as a dishonest tactic, and I, I want no part of it. It is. Yeah. However, <laughs> if you can make progress with him on a one-on-one, -on -one, keep <laughs> meeting with him on a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily cut off all communication or anything like that, but I would say you can't be a party to the, to the two-sided thing that's going on. Yeah. All right. I, I think Mark's ready to go. I think he I, is. Right. We're getting the, the wrap it up. I, I have a question. Are you guys going to dinner? And wait, where is that? What? <laughs> okay, we are, are we going still, to dinner. Is this still going on? Are they cut us yeah, off yet? Yeah, here it is. It's the After Show Star of India, 2900 West Anderson Lane, and we're leaving right now. Let's go there and talk atheism. Yay! I love you, Chris. Thank you, Chris.
Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.